Hello and welcome to the Sack Off Podcast. We are back. And when we were last on the podcast, we talked about the King's Long head coaching search. They were interviewing Mike Woodson. They were interviewing Vinny Del Negro. They were even interviewing Henry Bibby. But ladies and gentlemen, the Sacramento Kings now have their new head coach. And it is going to be Dave Yeager. And just obviously something Oscar and I have talked about a lot, well, in the past weekend and a half. But just, Oscar, when you got the news, what was your first reaction? Um, well, it's interesting. It's pro- we talked about probably 20 people, and he wasn't one of the coaches we were talking about. It seemed to happen so quickly. Um, and then, like, it almost wasn't a surprise when it happened. I think we were all kind of like, um, even that evening of him getting fired, it just seemed like it was an in- inevitability. Um, but it's pretty exciting. I think if... You- You'd said you'd come out with um, a 42-year-old coach that has made the playoffs three straight years in his only three years coaching um, with and doing that with a low post star in the similar of ilk of Boogie. Like you'd say, okay, yeah, that's probably the ideal uh, coach. And, and with like the kind of personalities of Zebo, Tony Allen, Lance, Stevenson, etc. Uh, so yeah, it's like it came out of the blue, but it's maybe like the perfect situation. And some, and one thing we talked about a lot is like someone who wants to be in Sacramento, and the fact that he, um, and we'll talk about maybe later what some of those motives are. But whatever reason he wanted out of Memphis to come to Sacramento, so that's I think a huge thing for uh, both. Uh, players like Demarcus Cousins like buying in he likes that kind of loyalty and wanting to be there something Vlade's talked about a lot is like with players it's like wanting guys that are gonna want to be there and one of the huge reasons why he didn't even contemplate drafting Emmanuel Mudiay's because he didn't want to work out there so if he doesn't want to be here we don't want to have him so I think that's uh, a really huge positive thing and something that I think that's maybe like the most important thing just from um, not really being able to truly know anything, um, we can kind of decipher he wants to be in Sacramento. So I think that's like a good place to start. Yeah. I mean, you want to like, because this goes back to the coaching search now. I mean, there were reports that Kevin McHale was top of the list, but it became pretty clear that McHale wasn't, he wasn't as in on Sacramento. He didn't, didn't love the idea. So Kings moved on from him. McHale moved on and, here we go behind the scenes, I guess. I mean, I think was it Amic or someone else talking about how Vladi always kind of had an interest for Jaeger or has for a while now. Yes, yeah, so they're pushing for yeah. a trade, it sounds like. Um, yeah, they're talking to them about a trade would involve a second round pick that was from Adrian Wojnarowski. So it's been a little bit discussed. And then just as you mentioned, the fact that Jaeger wanted to come to Sacramento, Memphis made the decision, you know, instead of negotiating this trade and dealing with that, we're just going to fire you. And then almost immediately, Sacramento flew out a jet to Tennessee to get him. And then they flew out to his home to pick up his wife and kids and flew him all to Sacramento with it to be there Sunday for an interview. Yes, yeah, so they obviously, like, and with the rest of the kind of interviews, like we had, uh, they got permission to talk to Messina and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, obviously, he's still coaching, so there's kind of some limitations there of what they could do really with him. But you didn't really get the sense with anyone else that they were really rolling out the red carpet um, and just obviously willing to send a draft pick and uh, even see if he was available shows there's kind of like more interest than just uh, agents leaking their coaches are going to interview Sacramento, which seems to be, uh, at least from all the Kings, reporters saying like nothing's coming out of Sacramento um, yeah. and that would also you would think be along the same lines as not hearing anything about Jaeger until the day he's fired so that's not that was not coming out of Sacramento that they were trying to trade for him um, that all obviously came out of the, the Memphis side um, and I think Jaeger even thought when he got the phone call uh, I think he was on a golf course and he thought it was Memphis saying that they've um, agreed like terms for a trade, so he can now talk to the to 
the king. So he thought it was for a, a trade or like permission to speak to them, not getting fired. Um, hmm. I missed that. That's that was a uh, um, Sam Amick um, had that on the A to Z podcast. So yeah, I thought that was a really interesting note. Or maybe that was um, the other uh, Jeff Seal got um, reported that bit. I remember. Um, but this kind of made a little bit more sense with the the Elston Turner report that he uh, was actually um, interviewing for the assistant head coaching job or like an associate head coaching job. Obviously, he's uh, Jaeger's assistant coach in Memphis. So that kind of, or was under Jaeger in Memphis. Uh, so that makes a bit more sense. And that's, I think that's another guy where uh, Vlade obviously knows him from the Adelman era in Sacramento. So he was a coach with Vlade playing. Um, so that's someone that Vlade obviously trusts for him to potentially hire him. Um, so you can maybe, I guess, like, uh, we can get into, maybe before we get into, like, why Jaeger was fired, it's like, maybe that's a one area in which you could say, well, like, or Elson Turner was, like, maybe trying to go for head coaching jobs. And uh, if he was vouching for Jaeger, then that's kind of a good sign. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and like Vlade trusts him, and then yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, like, I mean, this is a smaller part, but I, li- I like the Austin thing so much. And I just also kind of wonder about this because I, at some point he had to become aware that Kings were tar- tar- targeting Jaeger. So, I mean, for his camp to be able to keep that quiet, you know, that kind of speaks to, I mean, I'm, to me, that shows the commitment. Have the same agents as well, uh, yeah, Austin and Jaeger. So, commitment to Sacramento. So, I don't know, I feel. Good about that. And the fact that he's returning to Sacramento is nice as well. So are you happy with the way in which Vlade approached it with going slow then just once uh, once they had one particular guy obviously accelerating the process? Because uh, there was kind of reports that they were they were going to go through the final three, but it seems like to go, unless there was like a quick interview, um, we don't really know what kind of happened with that final three. Um, so I guess that's what kind of people wanted is them to work out who their target is and go all out for them. And they kind of did that, but just took a bit longer than I think people wanted. Um, and maybe it was more that there was kept being names associated, kind of the opposite of the Knicks job where people are upset that there's no names associated. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't win yeah. either way. Yeah, I mean, with the search, like, because after a while when you get to like the 20th candidate, it's like, all right, this is... This has been about a three-week process. Like, there's got to be some sort of movement here. But obviously, we see there was behind-the-scenes stuff where the Kings were waiting for something to shake out with Jaeger, where it was either a trade that they made or ultimately him being fired. So it's like, I don't know. It's even harder to judge, harder to judge because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes because obviously Vladi had an idea and he executed it to perfection. As we move on to uh, talk about Wallace and his interview, um, or supposed to interview or um, talk with Vlade. Um, yeah. I guess we can only kind of like hypothesize how much of that was about Jaeger. Uh, and we can kind of talk about, I guess, why Jaeger was fired. Cause I guess most of the narrative push now is that uh, he wanted to have more say or didn't like what the front office was doing um, and kind of made comments about the quality of the roster being old and not drafting Hood stuff like that. Um, so do you think Vlade was trying to work out what that dynamic was and um, why Ye- like why there was that kind of conflict? Or do you think it was kind of uh, trying to get Wallace? Do you think he just loves what uh, Memphis are doing and wants to kind of get as many of those guys over as possible? You know, I, th- I mean, I think part of it was him wanting to talk to Wallace and finding out. Because obviously Wallace, as mentioned, that was wanted an interview with them. So, I mean, like, it's, I think, part of that, but I think it was also Vladi gathering information like he did with all the other interviews and just finding out about Jaeger, finding out about Elston Turner, and building that database of background information, behind the scenes stuff to know what went on in Memphis, uh, what issues Jaeger had with Memphis, what issues the front office had with Jaeger, and just having that information so you can do a comprehensive background check to know if he's the right coach for your team. Uh, but you kind of brought up about how uh, Jaeger's 
like history is as a D league coach. Um, do you like, is there anything from his like background or history that you've looked into or just like his personality that kind of stands out to you as something that's kind of unique or, um, like in intrigues you as a head coach? Cause I think that's the one thing with Malone, um, that I think really worked is he was like hard on people, but then in the media, he was like, he was like, oh, almost like just capes for guys. But then apparently he just ripped everyone in uh, training. But at least there was that kind of like divide. It's like, okay, we're in the public, we're a family. Like, but because we're a family, like, we I'm keep our issues in house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the mafia, like the mob. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but I, mean, I think one of the things I like with Dagan just going to some interviews with them is, I don't know, I kind of like an emotional coach. So, like, it was a clip of him, I think, after the I playoff think loss. Him. Yeah, and he was talking about Matt Barnes and Vince Carter and just this connection he had with the players and the effort they put in and what it meant to him and what it meant to the team. And he was literally crying about it cause just so – of what it meant to him. And just from listening to other interviews and reading some stuff about him, like, he's very – and this, I think James Ham described him this way: is players go to war for him, and like that, we saw that with the Marcus Cousins who would go to war for uh, Michael Malone. So I feel like those qualities, it seems like some of those qualities are in Jaeger too. I guess we haven't really seen any players um, post his firing kind of speak out for, but I, I mean, it's not like they have much of a platform to do that anyway in a constructive manner. Uh, so it would be interesting to see kind of what um, players that have experienced him at uh, Costa Cufos obviously when uh, Jaeger was hired I think they traded for Costa Cufos that off season uh, he was an assistant whilst Rudy Gay was in Memphis so at least there's some kind of already built relationships obviously um, Jeff Green, Courtney Lee are free agents uh, is Benny Udry as well a free agent? Uh, uh, I don't know so someone needs, um, so it could be another target, but at least I think Courtney Lee, um, he was, he's very disappointed by the Courtney Lee and Jeff Green trade, I think is being cited in Zach Lowe's article. So. Yeah. And that speaks to, like the issues he had is just like, cause when they traded Courtney Lee and Jeff Green, he was kind of pissed cause he had no real say in it. Yeah. And they were kind of, uh, they were future, they were moves for the future, not for the present. Yeah. Um, and then I guess his, uh, idea is maybe a while like uh this is a roster for the present and so maybe that's one reason why he wants to go to sacramento or to um minnesota a couple of years ago is the opportunity to have a younger team maybe one that uh he hasn't got to kind of push the play in a different style they're very like set in their way um, whereas the kings are a lot more moldable I would say, as especially as like, um, I think he wants to play at a higher tempo uh, in with Memphis, and it's like he probably wants to slow down the Kings. <laughs> so that's kind of an interesting as well dichotomy. Although I don't think coaches that want to slow down, but I think maybe play more control um, when the first action's not there, then you get the ball into the post in the second option. That's it, and then you kind of, the third option is generally like a flare out for free. Um, just kind of like on their base, like horn set and pick and roll, lots of elevator stuff. So, um, yeah, it'll be more kind of a traditional triangle stuff, less flow. But there are like flow elements, like dribble handoffs um, and stuff like that, I think. And I think Boogie is going to be like the real star in this system because, and I think this George Carl year will be beneficial for him because he's going to have the ball a lot in similar spots um, starting the op- like how the offense starts is going to be with him at the ball um, at the top of the key or like at the high elbow and then initiating dribble handoffs or um, ball screens, stuff like that. Then he moves down into the post and the amount of like uh, easy post entries or just like uncontested getting to the low post that Zebo and, um, Gasol had, yeah, I didn't see DeMarcus have a single time where he got into the post that easy without having to battle a guy out or it not being just 
him running down the court. So yeah. that would be kind of interesting as well. That would, I think that would just like help his body as well. Just to throw it out there, because I think this is Matt Barnes, the free agent. He's from he's from the area. <laughs> I mean, chip with the Eggers. It'd mean, probably be useful. I mean, I uh, we can. I think we should maybe save free agents for another time. Maybe after the draft, when we have more like clarity on what oh, they, yeah, just, we might just some trades. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. To, I mean, they need all the wing help they can get, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. As we go into X's and O's, or is there anything else on kind of the process or um, the firing that you wanted to touch on? I mean, I think just one more thing on the his issues with because before just. Uh, because obviously there's a lot of rumors about what went on in Milwaukee, or not Milwaukee, excuse me, Memphis with him for the past three years, try, uh, wanting to interview for other places. Part of it probably was he saw how much other coaches were getting paid, and he felt with the level he was at, he deserved a raise. He didn't. I mean, he there was talk about how, yeah, there was talk about how he wanted to draft Rodney Hood as well. So it's just I don't know. I'm not, I, and I told you I was a little bit concerned about it, but. I'm not as concerned as I was a few days ago. I mean, he's getting paid less than we gave George Carl. He's getting paid, what, $3 million less a year than... Um, what's his name in Washington now? Uh, Cat Brooks. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Um, I wonder if Minnesota would have been more interested in him than Tibbs. That would have been an interesting... Uh, to see, because obviously they were very interested in him a couple of years ago. Um, and it'll be also kind of if uh, Memphis go after Vogel and then pay him more, that'll be kind of like yeah. also quite interesting. Although Vogel has a history with uh, that front office uh, going back to, I believe, Kentucky or Duke. Um, so maybe there's kind of like more inbuilt harmony there. Uh, but should we get on to kind of like how you think some of the current roster fits and what you're kind of expecting from Vogel. Yeah. And so one thing you'll ask one here about uh, you, what you, cause you studied some Memphis games. So I hear from what you saw from there. Yeah. So I watched uh, a bunch of like the playoff series just cause then I think you get, that's where you see the most coaching, especially kind of adjustments uh, game to game. Um, and I think he's a really good, as uh, in series game tactician uh i think he i pretty much saw like a significant change in like at least one area from each game of each series and they're against teams like golden state um spurs the thunder uh some they won some they lost but always you saw kind of like an effective change um one thing in terms of like defensive scheme you'll see like one uh, pick and roll possession and they will ice on one pick and roll. They will switch on another pick and roll and they'll hedge on another pick and roll. And they all seem to be based on who the screener, like based on the personnel involved in the pick and roll. So that's like a really intriguing or like just like a much better thing than what we saw last year where it's just all switching. So it's uh, in a Spurs uh, a Suns game I watched, which wasn't a playoff game, but I think it was um, to make the playoffs. Uh, so it was like a win or done uh, game. And so they were hedging on pick and rolls of Channing Fry, so he wasn't getting uh, open free. And then with, um, I can't remember who the other big they were. Um, maybe it was John Lua, but they were icing um, that pick and roll so they would let him pop up and open a bit more but try and keep the ball handler contained um, so that was really nice just to see like players communicate and know who they're treating in which manner um, I think he'll really like Willie Collie Stein from what I've been watching and reading he wished he could switch pick and rolls a bit more but he can really do that with at least with the bigs you can really do that with the likes of Zebo and Gasol but I think with Willie Collie Stein he can obviously do that um, he doesn't play rookies, you know, like young players much, but hopefully Willie Collie Stein doesn't count as young anymore. Uh, I think he'll be 21, 22, so maybe that's not young anymore. Um, 
in terms of offense, it's a lot of horns. Um, so that's where you have uh, two players like at the each corner of the free throw line, and then two players in each corner. Um, uh, so like the corner freeze um, and the ball handler at the top of the key. And then you'll have kind of different actions go from there. Uh, I guess the one thing I didn't really like in terms of the offense is if there was an isolation or a post up that wasn't in the mid, that doesn't have an action coming off it, that isn't really much off ball movement. Um, but most of the time when the ball's in the post, it's kind of the second option, then there's a third and fourth option off it. It's just when occasionally there's uh, isolation plays and stuff where um, it just kind of bogs down a bit and there's not really any off ball movement. But that could be p partly down to the personnel that. Um, Memphis have not really much outside shooting, so there's not many guys really trying to free up space. But you can have like uh, movement with like a Tony Allen can cut to the basket instead of being like cutting up the baseline to create um, those passing lanes. Um, he's a really good uh, after timeout coach. Uh, there was an interesting interview with Brad Stevens where he cited he said he has like some uh, plays called Jaeger, some plays called Carl Corver, and he cited um, Jaeger as his favorite play caller or like X's and O's coach. Hmm. Um, so the internet's favorite uh, play designer coach is the Sacramento Kings coach. There we go. There we go. Huh. So yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. And it would just be, I think that, I guess what you could say in terms of like how Memphis and really change when he took over from Lionel Collins is that he didn't try and like force him. He understood that, okay, these players have a limitation. Uh, they can't do what I want to do, but so we'll, we'll live with this limitation because it's the, the best way we're going to win. And um, we shouldn't force them these round um, pegs into square holes, which we saw kind of this year, maybe to a certain degree. Um, so I think that's like a good thing as well. Yeah. I mean, with the young players, this is uh, two, two things. Uh, I, I'm not worried about him and Willie Gladstein. I feel like he's going to come in and find that Willie Gladstein is the perfect player for what he's looking to, for to establish. And it's not like he had great young players um, to play, no. but I think the issue was he was playing Ryan Hollands. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's, no, there's no reason to ever play Ryan Hollands. Considering Kings didn't play him in the terrible season, uh, there's never a reason to play Ryan Hollands. There's not. So I mean, playing Carl Landry. That. Yeah, that's uh, He's the best player in that trade to Philly, ironically. Yeah. Oh wow, jeez. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, there's that. And I also feel like if he gets a say in the draft, which obviously it seems like he didn't get in Memphis, I feel like if he connects and falls in love with the prospect, that prospect will get time especially on a team that's going to be fairly young with some young talent and just, I mean, they're not going to have maybe the 50 win expectation that Memphis did. And I can imagine uh, considering he liked Rodney Hood, who was kind of like a seen as like a low upside player, um, like a solid role player, but he's turned out to be a lot better than most people thought. At least he was kind of right with that call. Um, and then you could also say that maybe fits with uh but uh, Vlade's kind of what we saw with the Willie Colley Stein uh, pick is like taking someone who's a little bit more ready uh, to contribute, especially with kind of the short uh, DeMarcus Cousins window with like two years left on his contract. Um, so you could see there could be some like harmony within that. And maybe it's just um, not just not picking Hood, but not being involved in the process um, or feeling left out of the process. So you, you can like disagree, but be involved in the process, and then you don't come away with it like salty. You understand why the opposite decision was made, but maybe you just felt he was being ignored regardless. And obviously, there was more moves later that uh, kind of indicate that. Yeah. So it's yeah. I'm just it's interesting to see what. I'm, but I'm I'm excited because I, I don't know. Yeah, I think my guess would that the Kings will probably be around like a top 10 team in pace. I think he does want to play with pace, even though the Grizzlies have been like bottom 25 or so in pace. Well, um, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Not, that's another thing because uh, one of the concerns was that Grizzlies didn't like him trying to bring up the pace. Like, because George Carl wanted to have the number one pace last year. So 
if Jaeger wants even like pace in the seven to ten range, that's going to be perfectly fine for the Kings. Yeah, and obviously the well conditioned to it now, and um, it also helps with Boogie that that he doesn't have to run right to the low post. He could just have to run to the top of the key. So it's going to yeah. save him for a little bit. Then, like in the flow of the offense, he moves into the low post. Um, so kind of like that in terms of uh, the pace of the offense. It's not just asking him to run down the floor and get under the rim as quickly as possible, where you can ask maybe what do you call Stein or Gay to do that. We just have to hope that Jaeger and his assistants don't believe Boogie's best behind <laughs> the three-point line. I mean, he'll play there quite a bit, but it's going to be more as a facilitator and to open up stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe coming off screens, I don't think we're going to see kind of the extent of trail freeze as we did. Although I think they, they operate well in terms of opening up lanes. Um, so it doesn't need to go away. It just needs to be uh, in harmony with some post action. You can have both. I yeah. think it's the key. It's not one or the other. Um, is there any other players you think fit well? I think Gay kind of does in similar, uh, at least offensive role to Jeff Green. Um, Darren Collison, I think, fits really well because there's loads of pick and roll, loads of horns. I think that plays into his strengths. Um, it's, it's an offensive player. Uh, defensively, obviously, he has his limitations. Um, I guess the one thing the Kings have nothing even close to is like a Tony Allen like player in terms of a defensive stopper. So maybe that's something where maybe he prioritizes that or not. We'll kind of see. Um, the draft doesn't really have them um, unless they get right up there for a Simmons or an Ingram. Um, and still they're not stoppers, but they, they're they at least better defensive players than the Kings have. Um, yeah. So that'd be kind of interesting how much they prioritize wing defense. Yeah, I'm excited for Darren Collison for what this means for him. Um, Willie too. But I mean, like, the other part of this is, like, I'm kind of hoping that Jaeger is – he doesn't want Rondo. He just doesn't see Rondo's fit, and that will mean Rondo's gone. But – yeah, maybe he sees like the issues of having um, someone that bogs down the offense in yeah. Tony Allen and sees that as a bigger issue when it's your point guard. Uh, yeah. But we'll see. Um, there's obviously a lot of politics into that move. And you never know, you may just get the Knicks or someone just overpay for him. I think that's, that's what you've kind of got to hope for is that the team wants to pay more than the 110% the Kings can offer. So that's kind of like the goal because I think there's bigger needs than point guard for the Kings. Yeah. Probably because the, the draft is relatively heavy, um, relatively strong in point guards from the little I've watched of them. And there's not really any teams above that are desperate for a point guard other than the Sixers, but they're probably in a position just to take whoever they have highest. They don't, I don't think they're still going to be looking to have a basketball team yet. And I don't think there's a point guard available like first, second, third that they're really going to be into. Or if they lose, the, if the Lakers pick goes, that kind of maybe changes it. Yeah. So let's, let's see what else is there. I'm trying to think if it's what the other thing about yeah, here was what I'm trying to remember. Um, can't find it right now. Dang it. Is there any other players? I think Caspi will kind of interesting. Um, they, he started using Jeff Green as a stretch four, so obviously that kind of fits in with Caspi and Gay uh, in certain times. So that would be kind of interesting. Um, he is really fixed to using starters, like the first 10 minutes and of the first and third quarter. It doesn't really kind of move from that, um, regardless of how they're playing. So he does have kind of like some rules that he abides by. So I think we'll get kind of, there'll be some frustrating things. I think young players uh, will be frustrated, but I mean, and rotations, I think we'll probably get um, frustrated with at times as well. He played a lot of Jeff Green rotations, a lot of minutes, and they didn't really work. I think uh, last year, four of the most used rotations um, had a negative plus minus, and they were three of them, uh, three of the four had negative plus minus, and they all included Jeff Green. Um, so maybe that's a Jeff Green problem, uh, but obviously having 
three of your four um, rotations being negative, that's not great. Uh, so, if, but I mean, lots of people had uh, Malone rotation problems as well. I think that's just the nature of like, if you can see when something's not working and you can kind of make up a reason why, why something else could work, but you don't really know um, yeah. the, how that relationship actually will manifest. What do you think about the uh, Jaeger firing does for Marco Bellinelli? Um, I'm not sure. It'll be. I, I kind of. There's been some interesting um, quotes from like. Uh, I think it was like Sportnado, the European website, saying basically Marco really hated Sacramento, uh, which is understandable. He played awful. Um, I think he, there was. I think it was James Ham even said like he didn't enjoy the way he was being used and just made him look bad. Um, so we'll kind of see. Um, I think he would still be a bench player for Jaeger. So, and I think that's what he's going to be. He's going to be a bench scorer with some perimeter defense out there. So we'll see. And he can only play the two. So he's a pretty limited player. I wouldn't be surprised if he got traded. Um, I'd rather trade him than Ben McMore uh, just in terms of like I think you can have a better roster construction with McLemore than you can with Marco Bellinelli, although uh, uh, Bellinelli is a more proven and more valuable commodity right now. Yeah. I mean, but then like, I like Ben McLemore, <laughs> not many other people do. I think McLemore will just end up on the Cavs pretty soon. That's, yeah. That's going to be unfortunate, but uh, it's... it's probably, uh, you never know, maybe um, yeah, you can find find like some defensive mentality in him because um, as soon as he becomes like defensively like at least average or above average like his shooting's fine when he's in, in the flow of the offense um, it's just like he needs to offer something else yeah, and I'm just trying to see it because there's our link about uh, Costa Kufos weighing in on Co- uh, coach Jaeger or Dave Jaeger being named coach, but the link's dead. So okay, all right. I'm sure he wouldn't have said anything interesting. <laughs> like uh, I like Costa, but I mean he doesn't really say anything in interviews. I know, like at least about the team he was on. He was on a like a Chris Mannix vertical one, and then he just basically kind of like didn't really say anything about the Kings anyway. He just talked about like his history. Gotcha. Growing up, and Chris Mannix is awful to listen to. Um, so that's how much I wanted to just see if there was anything interesting in it. It was basically him just like Chris Mannix trying to force um, Kofos to say how it was terrible. <laughs> and, and oh. He didn't bite. So that was kind of funny. Uh, should we talk about the lottery quickly, or is there anything else you want to talk about? Um. No, I think we've covered most of it. And just well, the the presser is tomorrow at ten Pacific AM, um, yeah. so we'll get kind of maybe some more clarity on uh, the roles. I wonder if we'll get any like Ken Catella kind of information as well. That would be interesting. Um, I don't know if we'll, I doubt we'll hear of any players, but it'll be interesting to see like how vehemently he like back certain players, whether it's Rudy, whether it's Cousins, whether it's Collison, whether it's Rondo. Um, I think he would probably not really put his um, neck out there too much, but it will just be interesting to see kind of if they draw lines anywhere. Um, so that's kind of like what I'll be most interested in. And maybe like stylistically, if he brings up anything they want to do, um, I guess like pace will be the word people will be looking for. Yeah. As long as he doesn't say everyone's tradable, I think we're good. Yeah, uh, I've got a feeling there may be a recent example that he may use uh, to pave his way through this treacherous first week. Uh, just don't get caught on a golf course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, with the lottery, um, I think well, we're, we were talking eight about days how, away. Yeah, eight, eight days, days away. So the Kings can't get the first pick because if it, they do, it swaps with the Sixers. But they can get the second pick. Um, so they actually have more odd percentage of getting the second picks than 
most teams where they are. Uh, where do you think they land? Because <laughs> there's not really much else to say. Or who do you think is going to the draft? Do you think they just throw Jaeger straight in? It's like, oh, you've never experienced a lottery. Go, go hang out. Also, also they send Pager. You think they send Pager? Didn't he go last year? Uh, who? I don't know who went last year. I think it may have been Pager last year. Uh, maybe they sent Vivek to the stadium. Um, or maybe like Chris Granger, something like that, or just the new logo. Have like a hologram of the new logo. Actually, okay. no, they're going to send. They're going to send that little robot thing that patrols okay. the parking lot. That'd be good. And it's just like he can look after the ping pong balls. Have yeah. we talked about the new logo at all? I don't know. We haven't. No, I like it. Um, I didn't like the mock up of the jersey I saw. Um, but I like the gray on the jersey. I think that's like a bold move to go with the gray. I think most people thought it was going to be like purple and black. Um, but I really like the gray, but not the the gray jersey with kind of like the gray and uh, purple font. I thought that was looks a bit bad, but I don't know if that was like an official leak or just like a mock up. Where's the mock up? Um, someone just posted it like a day after. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I'm so a big fan of logos. Yeah, the lion head one is really good. I like that one a lot. And the one like the sack with the basketball and two of the like half basketballs I really like. So they're doing well so far in this rebrand. Um, but no, I think have we got anything else? Uh, we should see the court soon. Stadium's almost done. So do you think that's next court? Do you think we're going to have two courts like um, like they did last the end of last year with the the throwback jerseys? Because the Bucks have that as well. They have two courts. I, I think so. Because after paying some tributes, I think, yeah, we'll see too. And do you think we have the throwback stay? I think they, or maybe they have like a modern, like a third uh, throwback, like a modern throwback, if that makes sense. Because that kind of the logo is like a bit of throwback in this. Yeah, I think because I think I feel like it was a big hit, so we'll bring it back. Yeah, maybe. But maybe they kind of want that to be like our special moment for like saying goodbye and then we'll move on. Uh, it'll be interesting kind of the approach they take. Yeah. That's... Okay. They seem to have a good design team. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's Because we've seen teams screw it up, but at least they made the right call on it. Yeah. Or well, what was the. I think I heard the. Clippers one is they just asked the guy who did the heat stuff and then he just did something and it was like, okay, yeah, we'll just use that. <laughs> Which is hilarious. Yeah. So oh, is there anything else you want to talk about, Jaeger or Kings, or should we bugger off? Uh, just, I mean, I, I, we may not need to talk about it, but obviously George Carl is his having his little media tour or has had it. It's just, he's enjoying his media time. Well, he'll he'll probably get a job back at ESPN because he's not going to coach again. Oh, and there's just one more. It, there was, I mean, it's not even an issue, but it was the fact that the headline they ran with for TMZ and multiple outlets put Demarcus Cousins' M dash brother arrested in bar fight. Oh, okay, <laughs> I didn't yeah, see that. So it was, yeah, that happened. I think over the weekend or something. But Demarcus Cousins was involved. He got pulled away, and just his brother got arrested. But Headline had DeMarcus Cousins in it, so that was that. Was that. Uh, I'm sure he's fine with that. Oh, I mean, I'm sure he can deal with his brother being arrested and yeah. taking headlines. It's good for the brand. Yeah. So um, that will wrap it up for the Sack, uh, <laughs> yeah, sack. Uh, sack Off podcast. You know, it's just so many acre bombs. You know, you just get so excited <laughs> and just... Uh, I'm so happy. We're gonna have to have, uh, we're gonna definitely have to have Jaeger bomb drinking games. Yes, live. St- yes, live streamed on the podcast. Yes, with uh, like um, the like have Sacramento Kings uh, bingo with Jaeger bombs. I think that's yes. gonna be the way. Oh, I'm happy. This is. I mean, granted, this is a final note for me on Jaeger. Just. Maybe it does go wrong. Maybe it does. But right now, I'm happy. I like the hire. And if things don't work out between Jaeger and DeMarcus Cousins, 
Well, we'll get to that bridge when it when it comes. It's good, and the bridge is coming pretty soon. It's probably got like half a year to kind of make that decision. Really. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I at least think like on the court, it's a perfect marriage. So yeah, as of now, I think it works. Well. It'll work well. And I think um, this is maybe the best coach, most proven traditional coach uh, Boogie's had. So that probably bodes well as well. Yeah. Definitely the best like pedigree and sense. Um, and also, I think this hire has like a nice longevity to it with the, the fourth year being a team option. Um, but also just like him being only 42, uh, only four years. This will be his fourth season coaching, so he'll still have some zest for it. Um, and I think maybe even just wanting to move to a younger team, even though the Kings aren't extraordinarily young in terms of, in comparison to the Grizzlies, they are. Um, so, yeah, it'll be really int- intriguing how it goes. But yeah. yeah. So it's... I'm excited. He's, uh, as soon as he's announced, it's like, oh, he's my favorite. Overall, what do you give the grade? Oh, the a. a plus. A. I if agree. With Messina, I can be happy. Um, I think he's got less risk than Messina, just because there's so much, um, just like question marks of a coach you haven't seen in the NBA. Yeah. And just last note, I've ran the NBA lottery similar about simulator about fifteen times. Kings still haven't won, so hopefully they win in the real thing. Uh, bet the over. <laughs> Whatever it is, bet the over. All right, so that will wrap it up for the Sack Off podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Sacramento Kings have a coach, and Vladi Divac, your process. It's not All venue. the crazy interviews and rumors. You had your plan, you stuck to it, and it worked off, and you got the right guy. You got it's him for a good venue. contract. It's Thank not you, Vladi. It's not Vinny Down Negro. It's not Vinny Down Negro. Not Vinny Down Negro. It's not Vinny Down Negro. It's not, Vinny Down Negro. It's not Henry Bibby. I would have. Uh, if it was ever Henry Bibby, I would have. Oh my goodness. You never know. But he'll probably get the Houston job and people will call it a mastermind. Oh no, it's, it's not going to be Henry <laughs> Bibby. It's going to be Kenny Smith. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's hilarious. Oh goodness. Uh, that, will be, that would be, I know. Um, that would be kind of fun because he'll probably have already done the 2K uh, like calls. And I think that was that Steve Kerr year where when he just made it, became the head coach of Golden State Warriors, but he was like, he was a commentator on 2K. So yeah. Kind of fun. So I have I'm, all, I'm all for that kind of chaos. Yes. I'm, I won't be buying this next 2K because that's Kobe on. Oh, well, that's. Damn. Yeah. Well. That'll wrap it up for us, Sack Off Podcast. Everyone, I want ben to thank Kobe. you for listening. Ben Kobe. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>